This video is sponsored by Boxu. More about them later. Hi everyone, I'm FlygonHG, and I decided to do my very first hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Scarlet completely spoiler free. I had no idea what I was doing, what any of these new Pokemon were, or what was waiting for me in the glitchy open world of Paldea, other than what they revealed in the pre-release trailers, of course. I also decided to use only Paldean Pokemon for this playthrough, which began with choosing my starter, the round and squishy fire type Fue Coco. He's perfect. I name him Jalapeno, and our brand new journey begins. Along Poco Path, I catch the story-mandated Lechonk and name him Hamon, though Lechonk is already a 10 out of 10 name. But Hamon isn't the only Pokemon joining the team, because for this first playthrough, I allowed myself to use every single new Pokemon. Kinda of violates one of the standard Nuzlocke rules, but come on, I mean, look at these little guys. How can you not use them? And look at how happy I am. I'm an adult, and this type of happiness doesn't just grow on trees anymore, so you gotta kinda seize every opportunity you can to feel something, anything at all. That won't be the last time in this challenge we'll need to adjust the hardcore Nuzlocke rule set I almost always play with on this channel, but for now we can head to the Garigmok Monastery and enroll in the Naranya Academy. By the time I've entered these hollowed halls, I already have a full team of six, including Amapola the Fido, Gordita the Palmy, Salchicha the Wiglet, and Lodo the Paldean Whooper. Looks like I won't be needing to take any art classes at Naranya Academy because I've clearly mastered the form. After sitting through a bajillion cutscenes, I get sent on the Treasure Hunt, which is Naranya Academy's well-marketed form of independent study. I'm basically free to do as I please and explore Paldea on my own terms. Not sure that's exactly the best education for a 10-year-old, but education is overrated anyways. With my newfound independence, I start making my way towards the first gym. Now in the spirit of trying to complete this game as spoiler-free as possible, I didn't look up the order of any of the boss battles or any of their level caps. I thought I'd just kinda figure it out and enjoy the open world for all it had to offer. My first destination does end up actually being the intended first gym, sitting in the cozy town of Cortondo. By the time we get there, we have a slew of new teammates, and Jalapeno has evolved. Indulge me as we go to my live reaction. Jalapeno is evolving! Woo! <laughs> what is that? What can I say, I like fellas with hats. As awesome as it is to finally see one of Fue Coco's evolutions, it also means that Jalapeno just burns through Katie and her bug types like a wildfire. We're a little over leveled, though I don't really think that even matters much. Katie's final Pokemon is Teddy Ursa, revealing that every gym leader in Paldea has an ace with a Terra type to match their specialization. This would be a little harder if Katie didn't Terrastalize, but she does. So yeah, it's a fire, it's a goddamn blaze in the dark as the bear cub goes down in flames and we win the very first gym badge of Paldea. With one badge under our belt, it's time to set our sights on a new boss battle. I decide to ask Nurse Joy where she thinks I should go next and she points me in the direction of the Sagan squad base. According to the map, Giacomo appears to be the weakest of the team star bosses, so I figured it makes sense for him to be our next target, and I take Nurse Joy's advice at face value, feeling grateful that Game Freak made sure to include an NPC that would point you in the right direction if you ever felt lost. Along the way, we catch a bunch of new Pokemon, my favorite being Siguenya the Bombardier. I hope you like birds because there's a billion in this game. Picante the Capsicate is another one, or at least I think so. I don't really know what she is, but she certainly has bird-like qualities. A few of my Pokemon also evolve. For example, Gordita the Pommy evolves into... Gordita the Pommy standing up. They kind of just rotated her 90 degrees, but at least Pommo is fighting type, which should be helpful into Giacomo's dark types. So, after raiding the Sagan squad boss in a mini-game that seems like it'd be basically impossible to lose, it's time for the second boss battle of the game. Giacomo leads with Ponyard, who immediately gets killed by a few arm thrusts from Gordita. The fact that we needed to hit three hits is a little concerning, though. Call it a hunch, but this tiny gerbil thing might not be the strongest Pokémon in the game. Giacomo's second and final Pokémon is a Reverum, which either is a giant car, or is possessing a giant car, or is part of a giant car. Not sure, but the end result is that I have to fight a giant car. 
I assume the thing is pretty heavy, so after the car uses metal sound, I go for low kick, which does a decent chunk of damage. Then we tank a powerful swift before retaliating with a nuzzle to try and paralyze our opponent. But it's here where I learn that Starmobiles can't be status. Lesson learned. Fortunately, this mistake doesn't cost me, as I'm able to best Giacomo, the Italian DJ, by terastalizing Amapola and taking out his Starmobile with a few boosted play roughs. With one of the Team Star members down, it's time to consult the ever-trustworthy Nurse Joy and get our next mission. Logically, she points us in the direction of the Quaking Earth Titan. It makes sense. Start the game with one boss battle from each of the three stories. Thanks, Nurse Joy. On the way to our first Titan battle, I catch some new Pokémon, and a few of my core team members evolve. The highlight is definitely evolving Lodo the Whooper. Don't let the ground clipping distract you from the fact that Clodsire is an S-tier Pokémon. Just look at this adorable little turd, I love him so much. The only thing better would be if he had a hat. Amapola also evolves into Dosh Bun, who's a better evolution than anything I could have imagined since the moment I saw Fido. The only thing better would be if she had a hat. Still, she's one of my favorite new Pokémon. Let me know down in the comments what your favorite Gen 9 Pokémon is. Anyways, with that, it's time to take on the Quaking Earth Titan. And for those of you who have played this game, you know what's coming. Turns out, this Ground Fighting Dawn Fan variant is at level 44, the second strongest Titan in the game. So he wipes my entire team. Apparently, Nurse Joy just points you in the direction of the nearest objective, regardless of how many bosses you've defeated. Which is honestly worse than if she just didn't tell me anything at all. Like, why intentionally send me to my death? There's no reasonable explanation for it, other than for capitalistic gains. Because when I wipe, look where I oh so conveniently end up. That's a really dirty business strategy, Nurse Joy. I almost respect you for it. Well, it's clear that a completely blind run like this is unsustainable, and it doesn't seem particularly fun. So here's what I decided to do. I'm not restarting the run just to catch all the exact same Pokémon all over again. Instead, I'm gonna look up the linear order of the boss battles and start using level caps. Since I missed a bunch of boss battles following Nurse Joy's asinine advice, all the Pokémon that I used prior to the soft reset will be boxed until the level cap makes them eligible to be used. It's not the most elegant solution, but I really didn't want to do the two-hour tutorial for this game again, so I think this is a fair compromise. This means I've got a completely new team of Pokémon as I make my way to the actual first Titan of the game, the Stony Cliff Titan in South Province Area 3. And it's along the way that I learned something very important about Paldea. Some of the random optional trainers can be really difficult, like this guy. Okay, Jigglypuff is at stockpile too. We're in trouble if it knows uh, spit up. Because that's like a 200 base power move. Ah, <clears throat> oh, crap. No! Narisita! <laughs> Over the last hour of grinding, Narisita and I had come quite close, so this was a very heartbreaking first death of the run. Well, first official death. The worst thing about it is that it was at the hands of an optional trainer that I only challenged because I got impatient while grinding XP. But this guy also has a Skiddo with leftovers, who manages to kill Bombio the Tadpole with a critical hit, marking the second death of the run. Bombio was able to nail Skiddo with a bunch of mud slaps before he died, though. So, Assetuna the Smoliv is able to clutch out a win, leaving my team in pieces, but still standing. In comparison to that Jigglypuff and Skiddo, the Stony Cliff Titan Cloth is a total pushover. Assetuna, with an assist from Arvin Shelder, is able to deal with him no problem, especially after we Terra type into a pure grass type and lose our weakness to Cloth's Rock Smash. So, with my Sentient Bike's new ability to dash, it's off to Artazone to take on Brassius and his grass types for the second gym badge. It'd be nice to have had my fire type starter here, but fortunately a handful of new encounters make up for that. Aranya, the little bug I got from Poco Path, has evolved into Spydops, who's able to trounce Brassius' Patilil and Smoliv with a few super effective bug bites. He's not the strongest of the new Pokémon, so he misses out on the one-shots against both, and therefore takes a small bit of damage as a result. Pseudowoodo is Brassius' last Pokémon, and I knew this one was coming based on the trailers. Rather cleverly, the fake tree Terra types into a grass type, which lets Aranya hit him with a super effective struggle bug, though that comes at the price of getting hit by a very strong super effective rock throw. So it's off to another new team member, Dose the Tandem Mouse. Just look at these little guys. There's beauty in simplicity, and this thing is just two mice. 
Anyways, I'm hoping Doze Bait's a strong grass type move, so I switch to Poyo the Squawkabilly, one of the many new Paldean birds. He has Intimidate to lower Pseudo Udo's attack, but unbeknownst to me, Pseudo Udo's grass type move is a new move called Trailblaze that boosts his speed. That makes things a little more awkward, because I wasn't expecting Pseudo Udo to get a speed boost. Poyo does no Torment and still outspeeds after one, so this will prevent Pseudo Udo from using Rock Throw twice in a row. Though, given that we still outspeed there, it was probably best to just hit Pseudo Udo with two aerial aces. But oh well, I have no idea what Pseudo Udo knows or how strong this squawkabilly is, so some of this is just guesswork. I'm bound to make some mistakes by overcomplicating things. For example, a switch to Carbone the Char Cadet on a resisted Trailblaze means that Pseudo Udo gets another speed boost. And then on the next turn, he outspeeds and kills the little guy with a rock throw. That's brutal, because Char Cadet evolves into Arma Rogue which seems to be a pretty phenomenal Pokemon, not that I would know since mine is dead now. But because Pseudo Wudo is tormented, I can bring Aranya in and use Silk Trap every other turn to prevent our enemy from ever connecting with a Rock Throw. And since it appears that his only other attacking move is Trailblaze, we're safely able to take him out with a few Struggle Bugs. This means that Carbone's death was super avoidable by just hard switching from Poyo to Aranya on a Trailblaze. RIP a little buddy, sorry for letting you down. Well, next up is the fight against the Open Sky Titan, but with the help of a newly caught cloth named Kangrejo, it's pretty trivial. In fact, most of the Titan fights are trivial if you actually do them in the right order, especially because the Titan tends to just target down Arvin's Pokemon, letting you get in some free pot shots. I'll be skipping the Titan fights going forward, but check out the Highlights channel if you want to see them. Since I already defeated the first Team Star boss, our next stop is the third gym in Lavincia against the popular streamer Iono. Ugh. Imagine being a streamer. Get a real job, lady. Her electric type shouldn't be too difficult for Lodo to take care of, who's now back on the team since the level cap is up to 24. Unfortunately, Iono leads with Watrol, a new electric flying type from Paldea, who's obviously immune to our ground type moves. I actually got one of my own Watrols, but she won't be important until later. Anyways, I switched to Kangreho on a pluck. Then a rock tomb gets the one shot. Belly Bolt is second, and I quickly figure out that this goober can't touch Lodo since he has the ability Water Absorb. So I take the opportunity to set up two layers of Toxic Spikes before taking him out with a Bulldoze. Third is Luxio, who lands an Intimidate as he comes in, but Bulldoze is still a two-shot into the Little Lion, who just does a bit of damage with Bite. That means that Iono's down to her last Pokemon, Miss Magius. By Terra-typing into an Electric-type, her ability Levitate means that she won't have any weaknesses, which is definitely the coolest example of terrestrialization in the game so far. Lodo gets nailed by a Confuse Ray and then hits himself in Confusion, but on the next turn, after tanking a strong Hex, we connect with a Yawn. Then it's off to the normal type dose on a hex as Miss Magius falls asleep. At some point after I caught them, chat decided to form a cult that worshipped dose like a deity. And frankly, I get it. Look at dose tear through Miss Magius with Super Fang and Double Hit. Iono's ace actually wakes up after two turns, but she's so mesmerized by Dose's ethereal grace that she just misses a charge beam, letting us finish her off with one more double hit. The cult of dose reigns supreme. After the battle, I discovered that our cult has a few new members. Dose has evolved into Mousehold, though I personally prefer to call this Pokemon Mouse House. The funniest thing about Mouse House is that there wasn't even an evolution screen when they evolved. Two more little mice just randomly popped up when I checked the party menu. Congrats on the sex, you guys. I decide to rename Dose into Dosey Dose, and then our journey continues. Our next stop is the Shedder Squad base run by Mela. Her Fire-type River Room manages to burn, like, half my team, which is entirely physical, so this ends up being fairly close. Fortunately, good old Kangrejo is able to clutch out a W without putting any more deaths on the board. With that, I can set my sights on the fourth gym leader in Cascarafa, who has a level cap of 30, meaning that all my Pokémon from before the Quaking Titan incident are back on the team. I've really missed Jalapeno, though he obviously won't be much use against Kofu and his water types. But Picante is back too, and she's evolved into Scovillain, who has the unique grass fire typing. I really love this design. A spicy bell pepper Pokemon? It's genius. But looking at Picante's savory, spicy pepper heads does make me a little hungry. If you're like me and enjoy trying new snacks, you'll love the sponsor of this video, Boxu. Boxu is a premium Japanese snack subscription that works with family businesses all over Japan to deliver a new theme of authentic treats right to your doorstep every month. When you start a Boxu subscription, the first Boxu you'll get is called Seasons of Japan, and this box has the best mochis you'll ever have. It honestly might be worth starting a Boxu subscription every month just for these little guys alone. They're that good. 
but following Seasons of Japan, you'll receive a new monthly themed box with its own rich assortment of snacks and treats. For example, this month's theme is Hokkaido Wonderland, featuring snacks from the northernmost Japanese prefecture, Hokkaido. We've been getting boxu for over six months, and every time the package arrives, it's an absolute delight to pour over the cultural booklet and sample the expertly curated selection of snacks. Personally, I'm a sucker for the sweet treats, like the Hokkaido Milk Manju and the Milk Cream Sandwich Cookies in this month's boxu, but with a vast variety of different tastes and flavors, there's something for everyone inside of every boxu, making it the perfect holiday gift for any household. So if you want to give your loved ones, or yourself, the gift of a unique culinary adventure and support my channel at the same time, you can click the link in the description and use my personal code, FLYGON, to get $15 off your first Boxu order. Thanks so much to Boxu for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get back to the challenge. In addition to Picante's new evolution, we also have a few new teammates that'll help out with Kofu's water types. Most notably is Zapatito the Discount Zapdos, who's the evolved form of that dumb little bird that Iono had. Unlike Watrol though, Kirkland Zapdos is massive and awesome. She's my lead against Kofu's Vuvuzela, which is a new water psychic type Pokemon that I also have and will be using a little bit later. An Electro Ball doesn't quite kill him, so he manages to clap back with a strong Aqua Cutter before going down on the next turn. Kofu then brings in Wug Trio second. That's a pretty predictable evolution for Wiglet, but it's still hilarious. Fortunately, Zapatito is a speedy bird, so we outspeed and kill Wug Trio with a Volt Switch, giving me a safe switch into Picante. Picante is up against Kofu's Ace Crabominable, which obviously becomes water type after terrestrialization. But I get my wires crossed a bit, and I end up accidentally using Flamethrower, which is now not very effective. That was definitely a bit dumb, but I think it's an honest mistake to make at least once. Sadly, I'm immediately punished for it as Crabominable nails Picante with a critical hit Terra boosted Crab Hammer, killing her in one shot. You really hate to see it. But Budget Zapdos will avenge her. Well, kinda. A Volt Switch isn't quite enough to kill the hideous Snow Crab, but it does give me a safe switch into Gordita, who has evolved again, though I wouldn't blame you for not noticing. Thankfully, she barely survives a non critical hit Crab Hammer, which means Kofu's Ace falls on the next turn, and the battle is won. The team I brought was pretty unprepared for that Crabominable, so I'm lucky that I made it out with just one death. Though, with Picante the Scovillain joining Carbone the Charcadet, that's now an entire Sinnoh playthrough's worth of fire types buried six feet under. On our way to the next gym, I catch a Tinkatink, the most absurd Pokemon this side of Regieleki. Well, Tinkatink is perfectly fine, but once Alamadenia evolves into her final form, she's gonna be ridiculous. And speaking of ridiculous... Oh, jeez, it's level 35. Uh... Okay, good luck to ya. Oh, it's slow. Oh no, is it gonna use counter? Don't use counter. Don't you dare use counter. No! The next gym leader specializes in normal types, so losing my fighting type Paldean Tauros is pretty rough, but it's a good reminder to always be on the lookout for Pokemon that might know counter. Who the hell is Larry? Is that the name of the gym leader? No! No! Why? No cry. You know, if I had a nickel for every time I lost a fighting type to a normal type using counter, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it's happened twice. I mean, I had no idea that Peter Griffin could even learn counter, so I guess that's a valuable piece of information. R.I.P. Gordita, you were a real one, and among the first of my team members. It really sucks to see you go. I mean, on the plus side, I found a plastic flamingo that's also fighting type for some reason, so I'm not totally without a paddle as I go to face off against Larry the Depressed Businessman. Also, Jalapeno has evolved into possibly the coolest final evolution of any Fire-type starter, Skeledurge, and is now part Ghost-type. But for now, it's Amigo the Flamigo show, as we promptly kick Larry's Komala in the face with a double kick for the knockout. That brings in Da Dunsparce next. Is Dunsparce's evolution everything you dreamed it would be, folks? Was that extra body length worth the 23-year-long wait? You know, I really can't wait for Miltank's long overdue evolution, Mil Miltank. Anyways, Amigo isn't quite able to one-shot to Dunsparce, but at least he manages to hang on from a Hyper Drill, whatever the hell that is. So Netflix Sparse goes down on the next turn. Last for Larry is his Ace Staraptor, who will presumably Terra-type. 
So I switch out to Brebone, my newly evolved Maboss Tiff, to get an Intimidate drop as the bird does indeed terastalize, and hits Brebone with a wimpy Aerial Ace. This grants me a safe switch into Jalapeno on a facade, who then cooks to Raptor like a rotisserie chicken. So, Willy Loman is defeated, and we've won the fifth gym badge. The next chunk of this game is basically a boss rush of fights against mostly gym leaders. It starts by heading to the snowy town of Montenevera to face off against Rhyme and her ghost types in a double battle. It's also kind of a rap battle or something, and my Pokemon get stat boosts by hyping up the crowd or whatever, so it ends up all being pretty easy. With the new level cap, Salado, the tiny Mario mushroom, has fully evolved into a Minecraft monster, and Alamadenia has fully evolved into the previously alluded to Tinkaton, who gets a signature move called Gigaton Hammer, which is a 160 base power steel move, whose only downside is that you can't use it twice in a row. Protect takes care of that issue well enough, though. Now, Tinkaton doesn't have an incredible attack stat, but with a few attack EVs, that's not really a big deal for at least the in-game playthrough. Alamadenio will be a pretty consistent staple of the team going forward. Anyways, Rhyme doesn't stand a chance against Salado, Alamadenia, and Siguenya, who closes out the battle with a Dark-type Terastalization to take out Rhyme's Ace Toxtricity and win us the 6th Gym Badge. Before the next gym, it's time to return to the Asado Desert and seek our revenge on the Quaking Earth Titan that caused that pseudo-wipe. Now that we're at the correct level, this sucker doesn't stand a chance. I mean, that's actually not entirely true, like a crit here against Siguenya would have left her with 12 HP, so I wouldn't say it was a total sweep, but Storkbird is able to clutch it out, getting my team their sweet, sweet revenge. With our bellies full of our just desserts, we set our sights on the 7th gym leader in Alfernada. Tulip specializes in psychic types, but before dealing with her, we have to complete her gym challenge. Now, I haven't mentioned any of the previous gym challenges because most of them are really dumb and a massive waste of time. They're clearly meant for children though, and there's really no point in complaining about the parts of the game that are obviously intended for Pokemon's younger, merchandise-hungry demographic. I didn't say anything when I had to kick a giant physics-defying bean into a goal, I stayed silent during the low frame rate hunt for Tencent Floras, I kept my opinion to myself when Iono made me do a Where's Waldo hunt on livestream, and I sat there in respect as Kofu had me bid $45,000 on a piece of seafood. But everyone has their limit, and Tulip's gym challenge is mine, man. What the f*** <coughs> is this? Why do I have to do this for a full minute? Twice! Do you see this face? This is the face of a man who is questioning every single life choice that has led to this moment. I hate you, Tulip. I hate you more than I've ever hated anything. Fortunately, I can take out my anger on the battlefield. Rebone kills her for Rigiraf, aka Honk Honk Horsey, with a crunch. Then Alamadenia flattens her Gardevoir like a pancake with a super effective Gigaton Hammer. Tulip's third Pokemon is another one of Paldea's many birds, Espathra, who gets overwhelmed by the sheer unstoppable force that is Dosi Dos. And then last is a Florgis that terastalizes into a Psychic type, meaning that Seguenya's Dark type Terra Blast gets a clean one shot, easily winning us the seventh gym badge. With that, it's a straight shot to Glaciato, where the eighth and final gym leader is waiting. Grusha specializes in ice types though, so just like Wolfric and Kalos, this is a fairly trivial fight with a strong fire type, and Jalapeno happens to be one of the best in the game. Grusha's lead Frostmoth is easily one shot by a flame charge, which should help Jalapeno outspeed anything speedy that might be awaiting him in the back. That's certainly not Beartick though, who comes out second. He goes down to a single Torch Song after we terastalize. Torch Song is Skeledurge's signature move, which has 80 base power and gives the user a guaranteed special attack boost. In other words, it's a ridiculous move, especially paired with the item Throat Spray that activates to give me a second special attack boost as Bear Tick goes down. This means that Jalapeno is at plus two special attack and plus one speed as Satitan comes in third. I'm actually shocked to see him tank a Torch Song. The Satitan I caught has the ability Slush Rush, but presumably this one has Thick Fat. Fortunately, a Liquidation in Retaliation doesn't really do anything, so Satitan goes down on the next turn to another Flame Charge. That just leaves Grusha with his Ace Altaria, who probably would have gone down to a plus three Terra Boosted Torch Song even if she kept her Dragon Typing. The Croc Sweep simply cannot be beat. With all eight gym badges collected, we can now challenge the Elite Four and take on the Champion. But before doing that, there's still two more Team Star bosses and one final Titan. The only one of these three bosses that's worth mentioning is the final Team Star boss, Aerie, who specializes in fighting types. So, after we mow down her minions, the final Star boss battle begins. She leads with Toxicroak, and I lead with Paella, the Vuvuzela. 
Toxicroak has Sucker Punch, which hits Paella hard for super effective damage, but then we retaliate with the Psycho Cut for the one-shot. That brings in Passimian next, so I switch out to Jalapeno on a Seed Bomb. Thinking I can set up another sweep here if I get a speed boost, I go for Flame Charge, though that's negated by Passimian's unexpected Rock Tomb. So I switch to Alamadenia, who gets hit by another soft Rock Tomb, though we now have leftovers to passively recover some HP. I decide to Terastalize so that Alamadenia becomes pure fairy typing, meaning that Passimian's close combat is resisted instead of neutral. It still does a massive chunk of damage though, but at least his defenses fall. Unfortunately, we miss a pretty important play rough. In hindsight, it would have been better to teach her Terra Blast for this fight, or given that Passimian lowered his defenses with close combat, Gigaton Hammer was probably enough to get the one shot there. Not that I knew Passimian's moveset at the time anyways. That miss is going to cost me greatly, because even after protecting for two turns of Leftovers Chip, a second close combat leaves Alamadenia in the yellow as the scary monkey finally goes down. But Passimian is actually the less scary of Ares' two monkeys, as she brings in Annihilate third. This is a Pokemon that, up until this point, I had never heard of. I had no idea what Annihilate was, other than presumably a new evolution of Primate. After a turn of protecting, Alamadenia barely holds on to a non-critical hit close combat, letting her retaliate with a Gigaton Hammer that unfortunately just barely misses out on the kill. Play Rough absolutely would have gotten the kill, but I wasn't about to risk another miss. A Protect reveals that Annihilate is going for Rage Fist, whatever that is, but with Fist in its name, I assume that it's a fighting type attack, so I switch to my Bramble Gas named Espinozo. And it's here where I learn that Rage Fist is not a fighting type move. In fact, it's a ghost type move, so Espinozo is killed immediately. Now fortunately, Paella knows Aqua Jet, which gives me a way to kill Annihilate before he can do any more damage. But for whatever reason, I switch in Seguenya instead. Streaming for 7 hours a day for 3 days in a row might finally be catching up to me. With the monkey taken care of, Eerie is down to her last Pokémon before I have to face off against the car. Unfortunately, that Pokémon is Lucario, who's a pretty big issue into my team thanks to his Steel typing. Lucario also just outspeeds Seguenya and kills her with an Aurasphere. She's been a staple since the early days of the team, so it's rough to see her go down here. At the very least, this gives me a guaranteed switch into Jalapeno, though obviously we would have been immune to an Aurasphere if I had known that that's what he was going for. I'm hoping Lucario doesn't have much to hit Jalapeno with, but that hope is short-lived as Lucario nails us with a Dark Pulse, which doesn't kill, but does cause a flinch. So... Yeah, this is definitely a wipe. Dark Pulse will kill Jalapeno and Paella, and Lucario's Steel-type move, presumably Flash Cannon, will deal with Amapola and Alamadenia, who are both currently pure Fairy-types. I decide that my best hope is to somehow outspeed and one-shot Lucario with Alamadenia, so I sacrifice Paella for the free switch. That's three deaths now. Alamadenia comes in and is able to outspeed Lucario, but a neutral play rough falls just shy of the kill. However, Lucario uses Aura Sphere instead of Flash Cannon. Turns out that Eerie's Lucario doesn't know Flash Cannon, or any Steel-type move for that matter, knowledge that would have made this fight much less of a disaster. This is a great example of how important game knowledge can be for a Nuzlocke. With Lucario down to a Gigaton Hammer, that just leaves Eerie with her Fighting-type Reverum, which is where most Star Boss battles get difficult. I'm pretty certain this thing has a Steel-type move, specifically Spin Out, which is revealed from a turn of Protecting. From previous Star Boss battles, I know that Spin Out harshly lowers the user's speed, so with the right plays, I think I can still win this. I switch to Sweet Amapola, who's bulky enough to rather impressively tank a super effective Spin Out on the Switch. Then she gets off a Charm to lower the Starmobile's attack, as Eerie goes for a Shift Gear. A second Shift Gear and a second Charm means that Eerie's Pokémon is sitting at minus 2 attack and plus 2 speed. From here, I start going for damage with Play Rough, but my heart sinks as this reveals that the Starmobile has the ability Stamina, granting them a defense boost every time we hit them. So it isn't long before Amapola's Play Roughs will be doing basically nothing. A Spin Out brings Amapola down to just 17 HP as we fire off another Charm. From my vantage point, I have exactly one play left, and it's brutal. Those of you who know what Amapola means in Spanish will understand why this next part hurts so much. I have to let Spin Out kill the sweetest of my teammates on the next turn, but her sacrifice does give us a shot. Since the Calf Starmobile is now at minus 2 speed, I can bring in Jalapeno, who's able to outspeed and fire off a Torch Song, which doesn't get the kill, but does enough that a second one definitely will. 
Eerie goes for a shift gear though, so now she'll outspeed me on the next turn, meaning that I have to hope that Jalapeno can survive a minus three spinout. It all comes down to this. But Eerie throws by going for gear shift. So one last Torch Song takes down the Cave Starmobile, winning us the battle and narrowly dodging a full-blown wipe. That was stressful. But somehow I did manage to make it out with my two best Pokemon. Still, losing four Pokemon right before the Elite Four is definitely not what you want, and I really did love all four of my Fallen Angels. They'll be remembered for the champions they were, no matter what happens for the rest of this playthrough. Well, after a good hour of grinding XP against Wild Chanseys, my reconstructed team is ready to take on the Paldean Elite Four. Preparing a team for an Elite Four that you know nothing about is definitely a unique challenge. I tried to cover for as many types as possible, and I also made sure to pick Pokemon that came from different archetypes. In addition to Jalapeno the Skeledurge and Alamedenia the Tinkaton, who have both proven their worth, my final team also consists of Asituna the Arbolova, who's the evolved form of the Smoliv that so expertly took care of the potentially run-ending Skiddo, as well as the Stony Cliff Titan. With her ability, Decent Bulk, and access to Growth, Leech Seed, and Giga Drain, Asituna is an excellent Pokemon to have on the team. Next is Hielo the Satitan. Almost every Elite Four has a member that specializes in Dragon types, so I figured an Ice type would be nice to have here. Then there's Walmart Zapdos. A Ground type immunity is always nice to have, and I wanted a speedy Pokemon on the team just in case. And finally there's Lodo. With Water Absorb, Lodo has two immunities and is also able to set up Toxic Spikes if I need it. I have no idea if this team is remotely prepared for what's awaiting me, but it's time for us to find out. Let's do this. First up for the Paldean Elite Four is Rika, who specializes in ground types. Her lead Whiskash means that my blind decision to lead Jalapeno was definitely a mistake. So I hard switch to Acetuna on a resisted earth power, which triggers her Seed Sower ability and sets up Grassy Terrain. With the passive recovery from Grassy Terrain and Leftovers, it's pretty safe to set up a growth, even if Whiskash does have a surprise blizzard. It helps that he misses the first one, but the second one does baby damage anyways, so Freeze was the only real issue here. A Giga Drain cleanly knocks out Whiskash and brings Acetuna back to full HP as Camerupt Up comes in second. That's not ideal, so I switch out to Jalapeno on a Yawn. Then I switch to a Yellow now that a Fire-type move definitely isn't being baited. This lets me cleanly kill Camerupt Up with a Liquidation on the following turn. So third is Dawnfan. I'm guessing he has a Rock-type move, so it's back to Acetuna, who tanks a Stone Edge well enough. Dawnfan reveals Poison Jab, which does a huge chunk of super effective damage, but then a grassy terrain boosted Giga Drain activates her Sturdy and brings us back to full HP. So on the next turn, I switch to Alamedena, who's immune to Poison Jab, and then promptly kills Dawnfan with an overkill Gigaton Hammer. That brings in Doug Trio fourth. Fortunately, this one doesn't have Arena Trap, so it's safe to pivot to Acetuna, who eventually kills Doug Trio with a Giga Drain, which means that Rika is left with just her ace, a Clodzire. Great choice, Rika. Anticipating a poison move, I switch to Alamedenia as Rika does her mandatory terastalization. I decide to terastalize to drop my steel typing and to increase the power of our fairy type moves, but a play rough obviously misses. Earthquake does pretty good damage, so I can't stay into a second one. I switch to Yellow, who gets hit really hard by another Earthquake. A crit will kill us from this HP, so I just have to hope that an expert belt boosted Ice Spinner is enough for the KO. After Clodzire wastes a turn protecting, an Ice Spinner connects, and thankfully it gets the one shot, winning us the first fight against the Elite Four. Next up is Poppy. Amazing name aside, she's kind of a pushover. Her steel types are easy fodder for Jalapeno, who sweeps her entire team with Torch Song. Her very first Pokemon, Copperasha, actually survives a hit, but she just sets up Stealth Rock, which won't do Poppy's team any good whatsoever, because we are not switching out. Against her Bronzong, I actually use Shadow Ball just in case they have Heat Proof. Corviknight is third and also goes down to a Torch Song. Magnezone is fourth and has Sturdy, so they survive the turn and set up a Light Screen, but at this point, it's a little too late. I take them out with a Flame Charge to get a speed boost that ends up being unnecessary, as Poppy's final Pokemon is revealed to be a Tinkaton. With one last Torch Song, Tinkaton goes down, and we've completed yet another Croc Sweep. The third Elite Four member is a familiar face. It's good old Larry, though this time he's pivoted into becoming a Flying-type specialist instead of a Normal-type one. You go, Larry. Way to reinvent yourself so late in life. Larry leads with Atropius, and I once again lead with Jalapeno. I start things off with a flame charge for a speed boost, and then Tropius signs his own death warrant by setting up a sunny day. 
So obviously, we nuke him with a sun-boosted Tort Song on the following turn. And I'm sure you can figure out where this is going. With the double boost to our special attack, the Staraptor that comes in second gets sent to the Incinerator. Altaria is next, so a now plus three Shadow Ball takes care of her. Larry's Oracorio is fourth, and rumor has it that she died so quickly that she didn't even feel a thing. The sun does fade as Larry sends out his final Pokemon, Flamigo, but with all the Torch Song boosts and a ruthlessly unnecessary terrestrialization on my part, Jalapeno burns the Waterfowl to a crisp, winning us the battle. That means that last for the Elite Four is Hassel, or Hassel, I, I don't know. Either way, this guy is definitely a Dragon-type trainer. Just look at his dopey cape. He does indeed lead with Noivern, and I lead with Hielo. I'm a little worried that Noivern has Flamethrower, but we'll never find out because after terrestrializing, a priority Ice Shard gets a clean one-shot. Haxorus is second. He goes for a nasty Iron Head, which thankfully doesn't flinch, because it means we can use Snowscape to set up the Snow, which has replaced Hail in this generation. Instead of doing chip damage, Snow now boosts the physical defense of Ice-type Pokémon. It also activates Yellow's Slush Rush ability, letting him outspeed and one-shot Haxorus with an Ice Spinner on the following turn. Third is Dragalge, but he too falls to a single Ice Spinner, though it does activate Poison Point. For now, that's fine as Flapple comes in and obviously also falls to a 4 times super effective Ice Spinner. That just leaves Hassel with his Ace Spax Calibur, the new pseudo-legendary Dragon type of this game. I'd never seen this thing before, so I had no idea it was Ice Dragon type, until I read chat, which loved to spoil things even though I continually asked them not to. In this instance, though, it doesn't really matter, because Hassel just terrestrializes into a pure Dragon type, who goes down to one last Ice Spinner, winning us the final fight of the Elite Four. That means that all that's left is to face off against the champion Gita. She leads with an Espartha, and I lead with Jalapeno, hoping for an easy croc sweep. That proves to be a bit too ambitious though, as not only does Gita's Espartha have Lumina Crash, which harshly drops my special defense, she also has a new ability called Opportunist that seems to copy our speed boost from Flame Charge. So no croc sweep today. I gotta switch out to Alamedina on a resisted Lumina Crash. I use Fake Out for some chip damage, which lets me get back to full HP with Leftover's recovery. Espartha then sets up a Reflect, so our Gigaton Hammer doesn't get the kill. A Protect reveals that Espartha's going for another Lumina Crash, which shouldn't do much damage. After tanking the hit on the following turn, a Play Rough finishes her off. This brings Avalug in second, which is a really odd choice for the champion. Expecting a Ground-type move like Earthquake, I switch out to Zapatito, but she gets hit by a nasty Avalanche that just barely misses out on the kill. Whoops. Well, a Volt Switch brings Avalug down into the yellow, as I bring Alamadenia back in on a weak avalanche. Then, a Gigaton Hammer shatters the living iceberg. Third is Vuvuzela, so I switch to Acetunia on a liquidation. Then, after tanking an Ice Fang, a Giga Drain one-shots Fish and gets us back to full HP. So, next up is another new Pokémon, King Gambit, presumably an evolution of Bisharp. A Koto Cleave does massive damage to Acetuna, but by landing a Leech Seed, we're now getting a ton of passive recovery back each turn. I don't know if Koto Cleave is Dark type or Steel type, so I decide to switch to Lodo, who will take neutral damage from both. After the passive recovery, I figure that I'm safe to stay in on another, but King Gambit actually goes for Zen Headbutt, which just barely doesn't kill my little Mudball. That was scary, but it does mean that we get off a Yawn. So, on the next turn, I switch to Alamadenia, who comes in on a nasty Iron Head. I guess Koto Cleave is a dark type move. Well, with King Gambit asleep, I go for a Play Rough, which obviously he misses again. So I switch to Jalapeno as King Gambit gets an early wake up and hits a soft Iron Head. Fortunately, Jalapeno is faster, so we just finish off King Gambit with a Torch Song. Gogo comes in fifth for the champ, so it's looking like we might be able to finish this off with a mini croc sweep, as another Torch Song obviously gets the one shot here. But last for Gita is Glimora, and I have no idea what this thing is or what he's capable of. Guessing Glimora's typing is a total crapshoot, and for all I know, he could terastalize into a completely random type anyways. So I decide to just terastalize Jalapeno and go for the kill with a plus three Terra boosted Torch Song. But Gita terastalizes herself, revealing Glamora's Terra type to be Rock, meaning that Jalapeno misses out on the kill and tragically falls to a super effective Earth power. That is truly brutal. But not once did it cross my mind that Glamora would be Rock type, or Poison type for that matter. Alamadenia is able to come in and squish Glamora with a Gigaton Hammer, which does win us the battle, but it feels like a hollow victory without sweet Jalapeno. 
I can still remember the very first day we met, when he was just a cute little Fue Coco, so full of life. He's grown up so much since then, and we've been through thick and thin together. I really can't imagine continuing this journey without him. And in any other game, I wouldn't have to. But in Scarlet and Violet, our journey doesn't end with becoming champion. Not only is there a final fight against Nimona before completing the Victory Road storyline, there's also a few more fights left in the Starfall Street and Path of Legends storylines as well. Then there's a final storyline called The Way Home, which wraps everything up and features a few more fights around what is absolutely one of the best stories that Pokemon has ever done. In future Nuzlocks, I'll probably be ending things at the champion fight against Gita, or possibly at the final rival fight against Nimona, but since this is my very first playthrough, we're going all the way. Let's do this. Now the fights against Nimona for Victory Road, against Arvin for Path of Legends, and against Clavel and Penny for Starfall Street are all really easy. I mean, what do you expect now that Dosi Dos is back on the team? Really though, it's Acetunia that slowly drains the life out of 80% of their Pokemon with Leech Seed and Giga Drain, and then the remaining 20% are beaten with a mallet by Alamedenia. Fun battles, but nothing particularly noteworthy. This means it's time to team up with Arvin, Nimona, and Penny and head into the Great Crater of Paldea to explore the mysterious Area Zero. And in Area Zero, we find... Wait a minute, I just realized that I've skipped all the story in these games up until this point. The reveals here aren't going to mean anything without context, so for those of you who haven't played the game, let me quickly get you up to speed. In the beginning of the game, my neighbor Nimona and I stumble upon an injured Crida and a legendary Pokemon that loves sandwiches and nothing else. Soon after that, we meet Arvin, the child of Professor Sada. She introduces herself over Zoom and asks me to help Arvin track down the Titans around Paldea. Throughout our adventures, we learn that Sada was a shit mom who was never around because she was so involved with her work and Arvin has grown to resent her for it. Also, he has a blind dog that's dying, but after eating a ton of weed, he's better now. After beating all the Titans, Arvin's hot mom tells us to meet her down in Area Zero, but Arvin thinks we can't do it alone, so I recruit Nimona, whose main personality trait throughout the entire game has been that she's a little too excited to force animals into combat, and Penny, the secret tech whiz behind Team Star who tried to make me empathize with a bunch of rich prep school nerds. And what's worse is that it almost worked. Together, teaming with enough friendship to conclude an after school special, the four of us mount Crydon and begin our adventure into the depths of Area Zero. Okay, so now you're all caught up. Once in Area Zero, we learn that Professor Sada has been working on a time machine that can bring Pokemon into our time from the ancient past. Coridon and the Quaking Earth Titan Great Tusk are two such Pokemon, but now she needs our help destroying the time machine. And to do that, we have to head towards the Zero Lab. Along the way, we have to fend off ancient Pokemon, all of which are pretty trivial with my team of champions. At the Zero Lab, we finally come face to face with Professor Sada, only to find out that she's been a robot the whole time. Apparently, the real Sada died several years ago in an explosion. That's right, the kid with the dying dog also has a dead mom that he'll now never be able to reconcile with. Game Freak really did a number to Arvin. Anyways, as we go to turn off the time machine, Robomami's defense protocol auto-activates, initiating the Pokemon franchise's coolest final boss battle ever. Dozens of hours of gameplay have all come down to this last battle. Alsada leads with Slitherwing, an ancient form of Volcarona. I know the typings of some of the Paradox Pokemon just from accidentally seeing them online, but I have no idea what type this thing is. I assume they're fire type, meaning that Alamedenia is probably not the right play. So after going for a fake out, I switch to Lodo on a low sweep. Okay, so maybe this thing is somehow fighting type? I decide to set up a Toxic Spikes here as Slithering hits us with a lunge, and then a nasty Zen Headbutt. I have no idea why Alsada didn't go for Zen Headbutt earlier, but it means we get two layers of Toxic Spikes up without any issues. I decide to switch back to Alamedenia on another Zen Headbutt. If Slitherwing is fighting type, a play rough will hit it for super effective damage, so that's what I go for, which miraculously connects and ends up getting the kill. Brute Bonnet is next, and this one I'm pretty sure is Grass Dark type. A play rough is once again super effective, though Brute Bonnet tanks the hit really well and retaliates with an Earth Power. After some recovery and toxic damage, we squash the mushroom with a Gigaton Hammer. So, third is Sandy Shocks, which is some sort of weird ancient magneton that certainly isn't steel type since they get poisoned by toxic spikes. A Protect reveals that they're going for Earth Power as well, so I switch to Zapatito. Then I try to nail them with a Volt Switch, but that ends up being ineffective as Sandy Shocks is evidently part ground type. Probably could have sussed that out based on the name, so that one's on me. Well, it's back to Alamedenia on a weak power gem. And then, with Fake Out and Protect, the toxic damage is enough to finish them off as Alamedenia gets back to almost full HP. 
That brings in Fluttermain next, and this one is definitely Ghost Fairy type. So, after tanking a Mystical Fire, we donk them with a Gigaton Hammer for the one shot. Screamtail is fifth, and since they're also Fairy type, I just protect on the turn that I can't use my Giant Hammer, and then the big round target gets bopped on the following turn. So suddenly, Sada is left with her final Pokemon, Roaring Moon. This one's Dark Dragon type, but I have no idea what they know, or if they're faster than Alamedenia, and the Protosynthesis attack boost is pretty scary. A Protect reveals Earthquake, which I worry will kill if Alamedenia underspeeds, or more realistically if we just miss a play rough. So I switch to Acetuna, which activates Grassy Terrain that will now reduce the damage of Earthquake. Roaring Moon nails us with a massive Dragon Claw, but it's not enough for the kill, meaning we connect with a Leech Seed that pretty much seals Roaring Moon's fate. A switch to Alamedenia is free on another Dragon Claw, and between Leech Seed and Poison Damage, Roaring Moon is losing a ton of HP each turn. So, in rather anticlimactic fashion, a Fake Out flinches Sada's final Pokémon, and does enough chip damage such that Leech Seed and Poison are enough to finally knock them out, winning us the very last battle of the run. Well, technically, there's a fight between our Coridon and Sada's evil Coridon, but that fight is coded to be literally unlosable. So Sada is defeated, Paldea is saved, my first ever Nuzlocke of Pokemon Scarlet has been defeated, and everyone lived happily ever after. Except for Arvin, who just found out that his mom died in an explosion and that the AI version of her consciousness would rather have adventures by herself in the ancient past than stay with him in the present. Well anyways, thank you so much for watching. This was a really fun challenge, and I'm excited to do even more Nuzlocke's in these games, so let me know down in the comments what you'd like to see. If you enjoyed watching, it'd be great if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel. Or don't, I don't know, but I do know that you should follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future challenges. You should also subscribe to my Highlights channel to get highlights of the challenge I'm currently streaming before it's cut down to a video on the main channel. The highlights that my editor is doing for this playthrough are really great and I'd highly recommend you check them out. I also recently launched a Patreon as a way to support the channel, which comes with bonus content and early video access. The links to everything are in the description below. Stay tuned for more Nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.